Okay, the next item of business is a debate on motion 15086 in the name of Kenneth Gibson on behalf of the Finance and Public Administration Committee on Scotland's Commissioner Landscape. I'd invite members wishing to participate in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on Michael Mara on behalf of the Finance and Public Administration Committee to speak to and move the motion. Mr Mara, around nine minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. In the absence of the convener and as Deputy Convener, I am opening today's debate on behalf of the Finance and Public Administration Committee on our report into Scotland's Commissioner Landscape, a strategic approach. I commend the report to Parliament and I move the motion in the convener's name. Uh, we launched the inquiry in December 2023, prompted by concerns that the Scottish Parliament corporate body supported body, uh, supported body landscape could almost double in size by the end of the parliamentary session with clear implications for the SPCB and the overall Scottish budget. The purpose of the inquiry was to establish the extent to which a more coherent and strategic approach to creating and developing SPCB-supported bodies is needed and, if so, how this might be achieved. While our inquiry did not extend to looking at the structure around Scottish Government commissions or commissioners, we recognise that our findings could be used to set the tone for its wider review of that public body landscape. We held seven evidence sessions, hearing from all seven existing office holders, committee conveners, legal and public administration experts, advocacy and support groups, the SPCB and the Minister for Public Finance. Uh, we also held two insightful and formal sessions where we explored the experiences of former commissioners and ombudsmen and former MSPs who had submitted proposals to create commissioners in previous sessions of Parliament. We thank all of those who gave up their time to speak with us. Their evidence helped shape our findings, along with research on UK and international models, including those in Wales and New Zealand. As our report shows, we have not taken a view on the merits or otherwise of individual SPCB-supported bodies. I want to reassure all members that taking such judgments was not within the remit of our inquiry, nor would we wish it to be so. We found the current office holders to be a dedicated group of people committed to serving Scotland in the public interest. It is also important to be clear that our report does not seek to prevent other proposals to create commissioners from ever coming forward. We have concluded, however, that now is the time to establish a model within which current and future office holders can operate effectively and coherently, and which is structured in a way that delivers the best outcomes and value for money for the people of Scotland. Certainly. Jeremy Balfour. I'm grateful, <clears throat> I'm grateful to remember. Um, I'm just wondering, does that mean that he believes the Commissioner and the Victims, Witness and Justice Reform Bill should be taken out and we should have no Commissioner in that bill anymore? Michael Mara. Not a position that the, the committee had taken. It's not contained within the recommendations uh, of the report. The recommendations of the report, which I will come on to, I think are quite clear, but it's certainly not within the scope of uh, the inquiry and what we considered. Um, so we have concluded that now is the time to establish that model. And I believe this to be a considered and comprehensive piece of work in which we sought first to establish how the model is working in practice, including considering the respective roles of the SPCB, parliamentary committees and the government. We then looked to try and understand what was driving the increased number of proposals to create new commissioners, as well as considering possible alternative models and the case for a review. The evidence we heard was compelling. It is absolutely clear that the current model is no longer fit for purpose. Without a clear and coherent framework underpinning how the overall landscape should operate, it has evolved in an ad hoc way, with individual proposals being agreed on a case-by-case -case basis. This has led to a disjointed landscape comp comprised of a collection of individual bodies with varying functions and powers. There is strong evidence of overlap and duplication across the Commissioner landscape, which we heard was currently being managed through collaboration and, in some cases, through a range of written agreements and memorandums of understanding. There is considerable concern, including from existing Commissioners, that adding new bodies into the mix would increase that confusion and duplication that already exists. As summed up by the Children's Commissioner, the proliferation of Commissioner's offices will be a costly exercise and may not provide good value for money for taxpayers, especially if there are multiple bodies tasked with intervening on similar or identical matters. Current accountability, budget setting and scrutiny mechanisms were also found to be, at best, wanting. We heard from the SPCB that it faces challenges in dedicating adequate time and resource to provide comprehensive oversight and governance of supported bodies. 
The function of the SBCB has, we heard, evolved in a haphazard manner. This governance role sits uneasily alongside the SPCB's other core purposes. Conveners also told us that parliamentary committees regularly experience capacity issues in scrutinising the effectiveness of post holders against the backdrop of many other work programme commitments. Current post holders told us that their experience of committee scrutiny varies, but all said they would welcome more regular engagement with committees. A significant number of witnesses also highlighted challenges in assessing commissioners' performance, including whether they have made a difference, are delivering on their core purpose, or if they provide value for money. At the time of publishing a report, there were six proposals for creating new commissioners being considered, all of which could be defined as being advocacy or rights-based bodies. My colleague Liz Smith, in summing up, will speak more about the evidence we received on the drivers for this increase in proposals to create these types of commissioners. Certainly. Sarah Boyack. Thank you. Uh, I'm grateful for the member for taking an intervention. Um, would he acknowledge that there are actually a range of different commissioners being proposed? And if you looked at the uh, Future Generations Commissioner or the Wellbeing and Sustainable Development Commissioner, that both of the consultations referred not just to advocacy, but a range of other roles in terms of scrutiny, accountability, best practice and guidance. Can I ask members who are making an intervention please to press their intervention buttons as well? And Michael Mara, I can give you the time back for those interventions. Uh, uh, thank you, President Officer, and thank you uh, to my, my colleague Sarah Boyack for the intervention. I think that the committee would certainly recognise that there is a wide range of different commissioners with different purposes being proposed. And as I mentioned, my colleague Liz Smith, in summing up, will speak more about the evidence we received on the drivers for this increase in proposal to create that specific type of commissioners. But I recognise the point that Sarah Boyack makes. So I now turn to our key recommendations. Based on the overwhelming evidence we received, the committee strongly believes that now is the time to pause and take stock before any new bodies are added to what is an already complex and disjointed landscape. We are therefore asking Parliament to agree to a root and branch review which will be carried out by a dedicated committee of the Scottish Parliament, similar to the review of SPCB supported bodies committee set up in 2008. The purpose of this review would be to design a clear strategic framework to underpin and provide more coherence and structure to the landscape. It would also ensure more effective accountability and scrutiny mechanisms, improve delivery of outcomes and value for money. Our inquiry in the committee's report provide a good starting point for this work. The evidence we have already gathered, along with the focused and short-term nature of the suggested ad hoc committee, will go some way to address any potential concerns members may have about its impact on parliamentary resources and time. We are also asking Parliament to agree that while this review is underway, there should be a moratorium on creating any new SPCB-supported bodies or expanding the remits of existing bodies. We fully recognise that this has an impact on those who would wish to or have already proposed new commissioners. Be assured that this is not the committee saying that there should never be new commissioners, but rather just not now. A more coherent structure will benefit the effective operation of all commissioners and support better outcomes. We also set out recommendations that can be put in place now to enhance the transparency, accountability and scrutiny of existing arrangements. We thank the SPCB and Scottish Government for their initial responses to our findings and also look forward to working with committees in early course to better link financial and performance scrutiny. We are aware that other parties have submitted amendments to the committee's motion. It is, of course, right that Parliament debate the merits of our report, its recommendations and options for a way forward. I look forward to hearing and considering those points today. Thank you, Mr Mara. Uh, and I now call on Ivan McKee to speak to and move Amendment 15086.3. Uh, Minister, around eight minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. And um, it's, uh, let me first of all thank uh, the Finance Committee for bringing forward this important issue to the Chamber today and for their excellent report into the Commissioner Landscape. And I was delighted to take part in evidence sessions in front of uh, the, the, the committee on this uh, matter. Um, it's important to recognise that this uh, work that the uh, 
the committee is taking forward um, is a, a key part of the wider public service reform agenda that I uh, lead for the government. And I want to come on and talk about more about that as I go through my remarks uh, this afternoon. The Scottish Government very much welcomes the committee's report and I'm uh, interested to hear views from across the chamber uh, on, its, uh, on its contents. Presiding officer, I've uh, responded on behalf of the government to the report. However, let me set out the government's position on the key recommendations in the report report and their approach to wider public service reform. The committee recommends a root and branch review of the Commissioner landscape and a moratorium on the creation of any new SBCB supported bodies or indeed expanding the remit of existing bodies um, and plans to commit, uh, complete that work by June of next year. The Scottish Government agrees that any new public body should only be created as a last resort, whether that's Commissioner or indeed a, 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 a public body across the wider landscape. And we have introduced the ministerial control framework to robustly assess any government proposals for a new public body, and I'll say more on that later. It would therefore support the intention of the report uh, and uh, a drive to improve governance, accountability and efficiency across the parliamentary commissioner landscape, and we will engage in any review of the framework for commissioners and provide any information requested if that is the direction Parliament agrees to. I would note that the decisions on establishment of any new SPCB supported bodies are ultimately a matter for Parliament to agree and the status and role of certain office holders such as regulatory or quasi-judicial bodies make it inappropriate for Scottish ministers to have any involvement in their appointment or any arrangements or holding their offices to account. Similarly, while we recognise the value of a review, uh, indeed. And Whitfield. I'm grateful for the Minister to take an intervention. In the Scottish Government's um, proposed amendment, which has been moved, the phrase being introduced in relation to bills that propose um, a, uh, a future commissioner. Is the definition that the government are using of being introduced the same as that as the appears in the standing orders on the introduction of a new bill to this parliament, both by the Scottish government or indeed by members? Minister. Uh, what we've identified, Claire, I, I, I'll come on to talk about that, is that bills which are already uh, been introduced um, and are before Parliament and its committees. It's for Parliament and its committees to take a view in the context of the discussions we're having this afternoon and indeed the report from uh, the, the FPAC committee as how they wish to proceed on, uh, on those. And of course, it's important to recognise that uh, uh, this debate this afternoon uh, in terms of the procedures doesn't uh, impact on the ability of any, uh, any member or anyone to bring forward uh, a bill um, and take it through parliamentary uh, process uh, as, uh, as appropriate. Um, so, um, I would, uh, uh, so wh while we recognise the value of a review of SBCB supported bodies, it's for Parliament to agree to create an ad hoc committee to conduct that review. And any decision on this will obviously need to consider the practicalities uh, and capacity of MSPs, some of whom are already serving in multiple committees and, of course, the role of the SPCB itself in such a review. In regards to a moratorium, the Scottish Government is happy to support a moratorium by not bringing forward any proposals to establish new bodies or expand the remit of existing ones while the review is underway, which should be completed by June of 2025. And we recognise uh, the need uh, that the committee has identified to bring some structure uh, into the commissioner landscape and address the complexity that, uh, that, that does exist. Uh, there are, of course, however, a number of bills which are introduced to Parliament before the committee inquiry concluded and where the scrutiny process is already well underway and proposals have been built on prior consultation. The First Minister and I recognise that these are now, as I said, in the intervention for Parliament to take a decision on respecting the lead committee's role in scrutinising legislation within their remit. Presiding officer, there are some recommendations in the report specifically for the Scottish Government to action, which I also want to highlight today. The committee asked the Government to set out how it plans to use its report to set the tone for the Scottish Government's wider review of the public body landscape. And as a responsible government in a challenging financial climate, we must ensure resources we have work as hard as they can to improve outcomes and reduce inequality now and in the future. Frankly put, um, any pound that we spend on back office functions, on uh, creating or setting up new commissioners or new public bodies, um, is a pound that we cannot spend on frontline services and supporting the people who depend on us for those services. We are already implementing a number of actions to support reform. Um, 
um, I previously mentioned the ministerial control framework, um, I, and we're also continually addressing and reviewing the public body landscape. And our message to public bodies is clear: uh, we should uh, not follow existing operational practices of public services can work more efficiently by adopting new arrangements, and we should not maintain the current public bodies landscape where we can secure savings and improve service delivery uh, by rationalising public bodies. I met earlier uh, this afternoon with the uh, non-departmental public bodies chief executives group uh, and had a great discussion on uh, these very points. Um, and we have collected from those bodies and wider public bodies over the summer uh, a significant amount of data on their operating costs, which we intend to public publish in the very near future. I'll take an intervention from uh, Michelle Thompson. Michelle Thompson. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. I appreciate that. It was actually going back to the ministerial control framework. He will note in, in the committee's recommendations, one of those that, that should be published now. Is that something that the government is willing to do? Minister, I'll give you the time back. Uh, of, uh, we have already sent the uh, ministerial control framework to the committee. So if that was the, the ask, yeah, that's, that's already, already been done. So the committee should already be in receipt of that, uh, that framework. Um, so um, I think it's worth uh, emphasising that point on the way the public body landscape. The government is very interested, as I said, in how we uh, redirect resources from back office to uh, the front line. And um, we have identified around £5 billion that is spent on um, supporting public bodies or indeed Scottish Government um, or other commissioners uh, and other aspects of the landscape that uh, uh, we are uh, addressing how much of that we can, uh, uh, we, we can drive through the savings programmes that we have in train to be able to fo refocus that on the front line. And it's important that this uh, debate today is in that wider, wider uh, context. Um, said officer, the committee has asked for the ministerial control framework, um, and uh, that has, as I said, been uh, been published. And it was uh, created to style ensure government proposals for the creation of new public bodies are based on evidence and value for money, and not only when uh, when required. I share the, the framework with the committee and welcome any input on the draft framework. And as I explained, this is not a final version; it will be subject to further reviews and amendment, not least taking on board the input from uh, the committee. And we expect this to be finalised by the end of the year when it will indeed be published uh, and sent to the committee. I'm also happy to agree that for any proposal that has been through the framework that has been taken forward, the assessment will be published. Um, I would add the framework uh, is for government-led proposals and does not act as a control mechanism for other proposals and would encourage Parliament to use the principles of the framework or a similar framework to assess proposals for any new SPCB supported uh, bodies. The committee also asked the government to update when it will produce multi-year spending plans, which will allow public bodies, including SBCB-supported bodies, to plan on a medium-term basis. And the Scottish Government is considering the timing of publishing medium-term spending plans in lines with announcements by the UK Government that a full spending review will be published in the spring of next year. To conclude, presiding officer, the Scottish Government is committed to reforming the public sector landscape. We have introduced frameworks and reviews, uh, are driving a number of programmes, working working very closely with chief executives of public bodies. We are serious about taking that agenda forward. We recognise the scope that exists to free up resources from uh, back office to focus on frontline services. This uh, Commissioner Landscape Review should be seen in that context. Indeed, I would very much welcome any work that uh, the, the Finance Committee deems it would like to take forward, uh, looking at uh, the broader public sector landscape. The cost of commissioners is around, I believe, £18 billion, and I have identified, uh, as I have indicated earlier, the cost of the wider public body landscape runs into many billions. So, uh, in terms of focus and opportunity for reallocation of resources, we very much welcome any contribution that the committee may want to make in that regard. Um, so, I am grateful to the committee and members for bringing forward this debate. I look forward to hearing members' contributions and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And I now call Maggie Chapman on behalf of the uh, Scottish Parliament corporate body. Around seven minutes, Ms Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am speaking today as a member of the Scottish Parliamentary corporate body and would like to begin by thanking the Finance and Public Administration Committee for undertaking this inquiry. I am grateful, too, to have the opportunity to add the views of the SPCB to this afternoon's debate and give some background to, to the situation that we find ourselves in. Colleagues will, I am sure, be aware that the role of the SPCB, as set out in the Scotland Act, is to provide the Parliament, or ensure that Parliament is provided with, the property, staff and services required for its purposes. In addition to these duties, the SPCB also has a statutory duty to support independent office holders. 
ensure, including ensuring they have appropriate governance structures, as well as providing their budgetary requirements. In 2003, there were two office holders, the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman and the Scottish Information Commissioner, and their running costs for 2003 to 2004 amounted to £1.3 million. The SPCB now supports seven office holders and will shortly support an eighth office holder, and it funds the devolved functions, the devolved Scottish functions of the Electoral Commission. The office holders' budgets, which form part of the SPCB's overall budget for 2024-25, amount to £18.2 million, which is quite a significant increase. Supporting office holders has become very time-consuming for the SPCB. In addition to providing and agreeing annual funding for the office holders, the corporate body sets their terms and conditions of appointment, undertakes open recruitment exercises for a number of the office holders, appoints acting office holders and accountable officers, approves determinations for staff, advisers and so on, and comments on their draft strategic plans. To ensure we undertake our role properly, we have put in place a number of governance arrangements including an annual evaluation process where an independent assessor assesses the office holders and prepares a report for us. We've issued a suite of strategic engagement documents which supports the efficient administration of the relationship between the office holders and the corporate body. And we've put in place a written agreement with a conveners group which sets out our respective roles and we've also established a shared services agenda. Yes. Whitfield. I'm very grateful to Maggie Chapman to take an intervention on that point. Um, have the SPCB always, if the member is able to, can she confirm whether or not the SPCB have always been comfortable with some of the challenges, particularly of management and um, internal uh, concerns that have resulted in some of the Commissioner's Office? Does the SPCB feel capable to deal with those matters? Or is that one of the challenges that perhaps we're looking at today? Maggie Chapman. I, I thank Martin Whitfield for that intervention. If he's referring to uh, operational challenges, those, those aren't within our remit. So our remit is providing the, the budgetary requirements and the, 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 the governance scaffolding, if you like, for each office holder. If the challenges are around those governance structures, then, as, as I've said, we see as we see an increasing number of office holders being um, enacted by this parliament, uh, we, we, we ask the question, and indeed we did at, at the Finance Committee's evidence session, we asked the question whether we actually have the proper cap capacity to do that role absolutely effectively. We, we, we do as best we can, but, but I think there are questions of capacity in, in this. But I mentioned the, the Shared Services Initiative. As a result of this, Four office holders are now co-located at Bridgeside House in Edinburgh, and there will soon be a fifth when the Patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland is recruited. This has resulted in accommodation savings. In addition, the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman provides backroom services to the other office holders, including HR and finance services. The corporate body meets with the office holders at least annually, and officials in office holder services meet with the office holders and their staff on a much more regular and frequent basis to share information and ensure there are no governance issues. Over the last few years, particularly with mention of proposals for up to an additional six new office holders, the corporate body has raised concerns with both Scottish ministers and the Finance Committee, and we are therefore very grateful to the Finance and Public Administration Committee for holding this inquiry into the office holder landscape. I should make clear that the SPCB does not take a view on whether a new office holder should be established. That is rightly for Parliament to determine. But we do have a vested interest, given how it impacts on our workload, our overall budget, and the workload of the official whose job it is to liaise with the office holders. In 2009, when the review of Corporate Body Supported Bodies Committee was established, the then SPCB brought forward a recommendation to merge the then six bodies into three, a complaints and standards body, a human rights body, and an information body. The proposal was about merging bodies with no loss of functions, but instead of the six bodies, for example, each having their own back office support, there would have been a maximum of three, 
and with the sharing of services agenda, there could have been even fewer. Two, two underlying principles drove those proposals, making access as simple as possible for the users of the services, in essence by providing a streamlined, one-stop shop approach, and achieving public services that provided the best value for money. The then SPCB understood that it was a bold proposal and that not everyone would support it. However, the thinking behind the suggestion was that by grouping bodies by synergies of their functions, it would lead to a more streamlined structure, provide greater opportunities to share services, particularly if the bodies were co-located, and it would make it easier for the public to gain access to the office holders through a single contact point. In addition, in proposing those three bodies, the then SPCB felt its approach was consistent with the recommendations of the then Finance Committee that had undertaken an inquiry into the accountability and governance of office holders. It recommended that in establishing new bodies, the first test should be that bodies with similar roles and responsibilities should be amalgamated wherever possible. The potential to pool the resources of existing bodies, such as sharing staff, should be considered wherever possible and unnecessary remit overlaps should be dealt with by removing responsibility from one of the bodies involved and adjusting budgets accordingly. If the corporate bodies' proposals had been pursued, it is unlikely that a number of the standalone office holders we have since been, that have since been proposed would be necessary as they would have been an established body to which a specific cause could have been referred to instead of the creation of a new position and the resulting additional governance structures and costs. Turning to the committee's report, the, Scottish, the corporate body very much welcomes its findings and recommendations. We support the aim to bring more coherence and structure to the landscape, as well as greater accountability, value for money, and enhanced scrutiny of performance. The committee recommended three improvements to the current system to the SPCB and we have written to the committee to confirm that we will shortly be looking at ways to further promote our shared services agenda. We will explore ways to increase transparency in our governance and oversight arrangements and we will also, in consultation with the conveners group, consider whether improvements can be made to the written agreement between the corporate body and the conveners group which sets out a robust governance role for the SPCB and promotes effective scrutiny by committees on how the office holders carry out their functions. I welcome this debate this afternoon and the corporate body stands ready to contribute to any ongoing work on this issue. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you, Ms Chapman. And I now call on uh, Craig Hoy uh, to open on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Uh, around seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. On behalf of the Scottish Conservatives, can I welcome the Committee's report and offer my thanks for a robust inquiry into a very important and evolving area. And for transparency, can I say that I am also now a member uh, of that committee, but having only attended uh, one meeting, I think it's too early to say that I've gone rogue or uh, native. Um, the reason for my party welcoming this report is that it relates to two important considerations, one being value for money for the taxpayer and the other the effectiveness uh, of public bodies and perhaps we do not look at both of those uh, enough in this chamber and as the committee notes it is time I think to examine both given the rapidly shifting sands both in terms of the public purse but also in the shape and scale of the wide range of Scottish public bodies including those su uh, supported bodies that we will look at uh, today and as we've heard the committee gave compelling evidence I will give way. Michelle Thompson. Thank you very much. I, I wonder if you'd agree with me that the addition of scrutiny of public administration to the finance brief and the first time that it's happened in this place has been very worthwhile and, and arguably evidenced by this report. Greg Hoy. Absolutely, and I think one of the things that government does not do often enough is look at government itself, because obviously yeah. corporate environments would do that each and every single year, and for government to be too busy governing the country and not to look at its own internal mechanisms uh, and operation, uh, operational procedures, I think, has been regrettable. And governments down the age, I think, have been uh, the same. 
But this, obviously, this inquiry does give this Parliament an opportunity uh, to probe this issue because, obviously, 25 years into devolution, we should be reviewing many elements of the way in which this Parliament and the wider landscape outside operates. Can I also say that we welcome the uh, moratorium on the uh, creation uh, of further uh, bodies, given the fact that we stand uh, on the, uh, uh, the, the doorstep of a possible uh, proliferation of the number uh, of bodies. I believe that is a, a sensible move. It will be for Parliament this afternoon to determine whether or not uh, they fully accept the Committee's uh, uh, recommendation that, that all uh, bodies uh, uh, should be subject to moratorium or only those uh, that are coming down the line, i.e. should those two I, I will take an intervention. Martin, I am very grateful to Craig Coyce for giving, giving way on the, the intervention. Is his understanding that introduced means the same as the standing orders? In other words, um, bills that members or the government have placed um, into the Parliament for the structure of Stage 1, Stage 2, Stage 3 will not be subject to the moratorium, but those, and in particular these are obviously members' bills that are still at consultation stage, drafting stage or otherwise, would be subject to the moratorium. Krikoy. Well, I, I heard what the Minister said in respect of that, and Liz Smith, uh, on behalf of uh, my party, will address that point, regardless of the interpretation uh, of either the amendments or the report and the recommendations. I think it would be prudent for any committee that is established by this Parliament to look at both the existing, the proposed, and those that are presently under leg uh, legislative consideration. And I think at no point in time should we set our face against saying that a body that either, either has been legislated for or that has been introduced should therefore not be considered the surplus requirements at some point uh, into the future. Now, the committee heard wide and varied evidence on the role, function, cost effectiveness of commissioners uh, and supported bodies, and it is vital that we uh, continue to examine this just simply to give due regard to the public purse, and I think we should uh, commit to doing this uh, on a regular basis. The committee also heard repeated calls for sunset clauses to become commonplace uh, when new public bodies come into being, not least to ensure that the landscape becomes cluttered or stale or that the effectiveness of commissioners or bodies is not blunted uh, over time. And of course, where commissions or any public bodies have been formed or are to be formed, the and their principal role is to be advocates for a cause rather than to have some statutory functional requirement, I think it is vitally important that we continue to review them and through time to remove them as the causes they champion uh, progress to the point where there is satisfaction around whatever regulatory regime or whatever support they need through public policy. And I think this review at this point in time also gives Parliament the opportunity to look dispassionately about the proposed proliferation of commissioners and whether or not, as Michael Mara said, this runs the risk of overlap or duplication, which is not only bad practice structurally, but it also is not in the interest of the taxpayers who fund these agencies, who I think already do sit back and look at a cluttered public space in Scotland, even though they cannot necessarily name all of the organisations that they are paying for. And for those who are watching, I think it might might just be worth, and there may not be many watching, but for those who are watching, it may just be worth just recapping those organisations that are already in place uh, using this system. The Commissioner for Ethical Standards, the Standards Commission, the Scottish Public Service Ombudsman, the Commissioner for Children and Young People, the Information Commission, the Human Rights Commissioner, and the Biometrics Commissioner being the most recent. Now, I won't intend to go into each, but in general, my impression is that, these function, that, that their functions go beyond simple uh, advocacy. And Sarah Boyack referred to some of the organisations that are proposed and also made the point that they may have functions which go beyond a simple advocacy. But I think if you look at this list, we are getting to a point where the fabric and the role of these organisations are changing, notwithstanding the Patient Safety Commissioner, but the, victis, the Victims and Witnesses Commissioner, the Disability Commissioner, the Older People's Commissioner, the Wellbeing and Sustainable Development Commissioner, the Future Generations Commissioner, and the Learning Disability, Autism and Neurodiversity, Neurodiversity Commissioner. Now, for the, for the record, these are all very important. I, I don't have time, actually. For, for, for the record, these are all important clauses, unless I can get the time back. Uh, yes, you can get the time back, Mr Hoy. John Reeson. Well, I thank the member very much for giving way. W would you also agree that there's an issue that it could be the, the stronger groups already existing in society which demand a commissioner, and the weaker and the, and the ones with less voice would not get one? Greg Hoy. I think, actually, the, the member is just uh, taking me on to, to my, my next point, um, which is specifically that, uh, that uh, there is already some very, very strong channels through which uh, organisations can communicate with the Scottish Parliament. In 1999, uh, I set up uh, Hollywood magazine, and in part it was to give the third sector and to other stakeholders a voice and an entry to, 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 to engage with this Parliament. Um, and 
we very rapidly found out that Parliament itself has set up good mechanisms for that uh, through which third uh, sector groups and other organisations could engage uh, with the, the, the Parliament. Um, and I think the Parliament continues to take, to, uh, take engagement very seriously through consultations, through the committee structure, through cross-party groups, through policies being developed alongside and with those with lived experience and via a plethora, perhaps on occasion uh, too many working groups, action plans and other, other forums. And since I, since I launched Hollywood Magazine 25 years ago, I went on to do something similar in London, in Brussels, in uh, Asia, in China, where the door is not open to external organisations uh, and through other uh, organisations such as the, the ASEAN Secretariat. And all of those uh, organisations, can I just say that um, third party organisations struggle to get a foot in the door. Here the door is opened and they have a seat at the table. And therefore I do wonder whether or not if we're going down the route of using the structure of commissioners to give a platform to advocacy groups, we are in effect actually duplicating what is, what is already a very vibrant and engaged civil society uh, pr uh, process uh, in, this, in this parliament. Um, I will give way briefly on that point. Colin Smith. Craig Hoyt is making the point that, that, that all these third sector organisations and charities um, have an appropriate forum in order to raise their concerns. Why then does he think, for example, 31 charities and third sector organisations signed a statement calling for an older people's commissioner? Why do you think 90 per cent of people who took part in my consultation with older people's commissioner believe that's the right way forward because the existing structures are failing, including these organisations that he says have got plenty of forums? Craig Hoyt. I think that's because there's a difference between giving somebody a voice and the person who's listening, listening to that voice res responding to it. I think um, if I speak to, for example, when I was uh, shadowing uh, social care, I spoke to many organisations that were supportive of a national care service. And that the principle of a national care, care service was through co-design. As time progressed, uh, the government had one idea of the national care service and the stakeholders another. And that is why the national care service is in such uh, a dire uh, position. I don't think that had, had there been a care uh, a, a care commissioner, that their voice would have been any more powerful. Uh, and I also think the, the other issue here is that many of those organisations are already funded in part by the government, and to then have a government effectively a taxpayer-funded uh, commissioner, again, is a duplication uh, of uh, taxpayers' um, money. I think the fundamental point is that some of these commissioners do have a statutory function and they, then they perform a function, for example, Ethical Standards or the, or the Standards Commission. Looking down the list of new commissioners, I do think there's a significant chance of simply duplicating what civil society is already doing in Scotland. I very much welcome this review. I look forward to uh, the Parliament debating this this afternoon. I hope the committee will be formed and I hope it will come to the conclusion that it has to do two things. It has to make sure that government and structures are effective in this country and that we have due regard to the public purse. Thank you, Mr Hoy. I now call on Sarah Boyack to speak to and to move Amendment 15086.2. Around six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I do also want to start by thanking the committee for the report, because I think it's an important debate for us to have. And I think it's important that, in the words of the report, that we have an SPCB-supported body landscape which is fit for the future. So I very much welcome a review into the SPCB bodies to make sure that Parliament money is being spent well. It's a question of good governance, and hopefully we can move to, towards that together as a Parliament. Any review would have to have a timescale attached to it to avoid endless delays, and the motion before us today does not include that timescale, so I strongly welcome the fact that all three proposed amendments highlight the need for a deadline for the conclusion of the report by June 2025. So I move the amendment in my name. While a review is necessary, we also must not downplay the impact of existing commissioners. For example, together, the Scottish Alliance for Children's Rights prepared a briefing which highlighted the vital contribution that the Children's Commissioner has delivered. And I also worry that the reference to a moratorium in the report on creating any new SPCB bodies was ambiguous and needs clarity. So I very much welcome the Minister's clarification that in relation to his amendment, members who have secured the right to introduce a bill are able to progress that bill as it's being drafted. And I think that's really important um, because it then still leaves it up to the Parliament to make a decision on each of those bills. And in relation to the phrase about creating new SPCB-supported bodies, 
I think it's important to clarify what constitutes the creation of a body. Would that follow the passage of a bill, but not necessarily preclude the third stage legislative scrutiny process? So I think there are one or two issues that do need to be clarified in relation to the potential committee that's been suggested. I think it's been made several times that we all know that the capacity of Parliament and committees are stretched. More ministers mean fewer backbenchers. The Scottish Government, in terms of its staff, is bigger than ever, an increase of 6,000 to 9,000 staff. And the Parliament has to scrutinise more topics as new responsibilities have been devolved, never mind delivering post-legislative scrutiny on the hundreds of acts which have now been introduced since 1999. And I thought the particular points made by Maggie Chapman on the pressures that SPCB faces were extremely well made. So the committee report recognises the need for these commissioners and why roles are being suggested. And in relation to the Older People's Commissioner, I thought the independent age briefing highlighting that methods are urgently developed to ensure older people's interests are understood and advanced within political decision-making processes was really important. And as members have agreed uh, briefly... John Mason. Sorry, I didn't press my button on that point. I mean, does, does she not think that the older people's sector, and, and although older people are really good at voting, we've got groups like Age Scotland, are they not well represented already? Steve Boyack. Well, there's a question of representation and then there's a question of scrutiny. Um, I, I think it's not just advocacy, and in a way, that's the discussion to have when my colleague Colin uh, moves forward with his legislation because there is a proposal there that needs to be discussed. I think all members have agreed that proper scrutiny and parliamentary accountability is important, but we all know that committees are stretched beyond capacity. And the approach they have in Wales, I think, makes a huge amount of sense, which is that there is an annual scrutiny process. But as the report acknowledged, not all commissioners are the same, if it's brief. Craig Coy. Isn't it incumbent on all of us as members of parliament who are elected to represent our, our, our constituents that we scrutinise the work of government in respect of these issues, be they older people or children? Zero about it. Absolutely. But you know, I wouldn't go as far as uh, was suggested in the report by Professor Alan Page, but uh, is the MSP not my commissioner? I think there's something about structural integrity, accountability and reporting back that we do not have as individual members. I would love to scrutinise the national performance framework and question how it's uh, implementing sustainable development goals. There's no way I can do that as an individual member. So there's a point about having that collective responsibility and focus. As the report acknowledged and has been mentioned by a couple of members, not all commissioners are the same. This week we saw the importance of the Information Commissioner and uh, the, the comments in the report by the Biometric Commissioner in the report were really valuable in terms of the issue of timescales and changes relating to the purpose of commissioners when they're established and in the years after. So I think those issues are important that are uh, considered by a committee that gets established. Um, and I think the other point made was that the term commissioner can mean different things to different people. But stopping all commissioners would potentially be throwing the baby out of the bathwater. So we do need to have proper consideration. I just wanted to give a sense of the discussions I've been having in terms of my Members' Bill, because uh, my Members' Bill, which recommends a wellbeing and future uh, a sustainable development uh, bill, and the Scottish Government had also consulted on a future generations commissioner. If you look at the two consultation documents, they're incredibly similar and there's a huge overlap. And I just wanted to say, put on the record, that I had an excellent meeting with the Deputy First Minister and the Minister for Community Wellbeing, and we have agreed to engage constructively with my Members' Bill. They're very keen to see the draft which is currently being prepared by the Non-Government Bills Unit. Uh, that does not uh, say that they will support uh, my bill or indeed any of the details in it, but that's a constructive dialogue. Um, and the consultations we both carried out were incredibly supportive. Um, and I think the, the comments that were made, particularly by Chris Hoy, about value for money, with our ageing population, the huge pressures on our NHS, 
The recommendations on the Christie Commission in 2011, which is still to be implemented, and the need to tackle our climate crisis while creating jobs, investing in our communities, we do need joined up action in a way we're simply not getting at the moment. And the recent report produced by Carnegie, the academic report, pointed out that the national performance framework is insufficient when it comes to ensuring sustainability and well-being is at the heart of policy making. I thought the points um, that Michael Morrow was making about advocacy are important, but I think that term about commissioner, actually it can mean very different roles um, in terms of accountability, scrutiny, and there's a real issue about making sure that successive governments um, of any party meet legal targets and achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals across all policy areas. And it's currently an area where there is significant scrutiny. Carnegie talked about the need for a helicopter approach which is not just about individual committees, but cross-committee, cross-ministerial um, reviews. So I think reform of the Commissioner landscape should take greater consideration of progress made in other countries. I hope that would be included in the work of the committee. Um, the Welsh Commissioner has greatly has shaped uh, my thoughts in terms of the work the Non-Government Bills Unit is doing drafting my bill. Um, and I've looked at the savings that the Future Generations Commission in Wales actually led to the financial savings and the clarity and the sense of direction that the Welsh Government has picked up since. Um, Colin Smith talked about lobbying from organisations. Um, earlier this month, we all issued a letter by more than 130 organisations urging the First Minister to support my bill, and it was an issue pre-2021. So it's an ongoing conversation. So in conclusion, Presiding Officer, I very much welcome the opportunity for a proper discussion. The Scottish Human Rights Commission has highlighted the need for a coherent infrastructure, but we should be careful not to downplay or reduce the effective work of existing commissioners. The more integrated working and support is important, but let's not forget the importance of their remits. The Scottish Parliament regularly struggles with long-term thinking. Commissioners potentially enable a bigger approach, bigger picture approach to legislation, improve scrutiny, increase action on the important issues our constituents elected us to act upon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms Boyack. And I now call on Ross Greer to speak to you in the move amendment 15086.1. Around six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I move the amendment in my name. This is one of the most important committee debates that I can remember in my time in this Parliament. I certainly think it's the most important committee debate that I've participated in. And it's asking all of us, we're asking ourselves to do something that is politically difficult but necessary, which I think emphasises the need for us to do this by consensus. The principles that we're addressing here are around democratic accountability, upholding the rights of our constituents, effective governance, value for money. These are all of fundamental importance to this parliament and to the country at large. And the debate is also revealing some interesting facts about this institution, including the failures of our institutional memory. Our committee report highlights the work of the Session 2 Finance Committee on developing criteria for SPCB-appointed bodies. Maggie Chapman's speech on behalf of the corporate body cites previous work that they've undertaken and that uh, previous committees have undertaken as well, much of which I wasn't aware of until we started this inquiry, despite having been a member of this parliament for now eight years. There's clear evidence that the current system isn't working. It's evolved in an ad hoc and an inconsistent manner, and that can't continue, let alone become more profound. The public struggle to access what they can understand, and what we have at present, and what we would have to a greater extent uh, if we do not take some kind of holistic action, is variation in the powers and functions of commissioners, elements of duplication and overlap. Michael Mara mentioned that a number of commissioners have their own bespoke agreements with each other to try and deal with this. But the more bodies created, the more of a challenge that obviously becomes. And we'll all be familiar from uh, our experience with casework of constituents who are passed from pillar to post between different public bodies as it is. We also need to reckon with the fact that this is going to get beyond the capacity of the Scottish Parliament corporate body to manage. It's not only a capacity issue, though. And we do need to face up to the fact that 
we have so many proposals now for new commissioners because a whole range of groups across society feel a lack of attention, a lack of effective action is being taken by government and by parliament. That parliament is not effectively scrutinising their issues, what affects their lives. And we also need to face up to the fact that we as a parliament collectively probably don't sufficiently scrutinise the corporate body and provide them, I think, with the support that they sometimes need. There are 129 members of this place. Yes. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful for Oscar taking an intervention. And it's not the challenge that if we proceed today as we're likely to, that actually reinforces the views of people outside of this parliament, that both the parliament and the Scottish government lack care about them. I'm going to address that point um, in more detail later on, but I think that's where there's a challenge of where we sometimes have to do what is difficult, but we collectively understand is necessary. And if we do not take a holistic approach to this and we take it on a proposal by proposal basis, it is infinitely more difficult because somebody has to put their head above the parapet and say that group there who have serious challenges in their lives do not deserve the advocacy of a commissioner. That's why we need to take a holistic approach to this. Yes. Jeremy Balfour. Um, I, I'm grateful to remember. We remember except that even if the committee reports by summer of next year, there will be no structural changes within this parliament and it will be the next parliament that legislates if any changes come forward. So we will see no progress in regard to this for the next 14 to 15 months minimum. Roscoe. I'm grateful to that intervention, but I don't accept that point because not all the changes that are required would require primary legislation. The committee sets out a number of recommendations, including to the corporate body, uh, to parliament as a whole, and to government that don't all require primary legislation. There is a wider point here, though. There are 129 members of this parliament. There were 129 in 1999. But we have far more power and responsibility than we did then. And I think that this points towards the need for a wider debate around parliamentary reform. I would note that uh, Myrtle Fraser published a paper marking the 25th anniversary of this place with a range of proposals around reform, including consideration of the number of MSPs. The presiding officer also made comments about that uh, at events surrounding the 25th anniversary. I would also suggest that if we had stronger local government in Scotland, less of a burden would fall onto this place. There's a range of proposals from elsewhere that can be considered. In Sweden, for example, when someone is appointed to the government, they are no longer a member of parliament and a substitute member is appointed to parliament in their place to ensure parliament is of sufficient size to scrutinise the government. That's not compatible with the electoral system that we've got, but there are a range of proposals that we should start considering there. Because there's democratic implications of outsourcing scrutiny. And let's be honest, I don't think Parliament is effectively scrutinising the commissioners themselves. Even those who are in here regularly, who are effectively advocating for those they represent, we often find ourselves in a position where we can't scrutinise their own functions. They are in regularly enough discussing other issues. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to, to make progress at this point. We do need to ask the question, do commissioners actually improve outcomes? And I don't want to get drawn into debates on any specific proposals today, but I would encourage those members who are bringing forward proposals to seriously consider that because it was a consistent theme of the evidence that the committee received. I don't believe that there are people out there whose ultimate desire is to have a commissioner represent them. There are people whose ultimate desire, quite rightly, is to have their rights upheld and to have a better experience, particularly in engaging with public services. Services. So we should ask the question, why are we facing a sudden growth in the number of proposals for new commissioners? Personally, I think it's the financial reality of recent years. Of course, people aren't getting what they need from public services if those services are not sufficiently resourced. The creation of new commissioners does not resolve that issue. And I would point to the comments the Minister uh, made and that were in the committee's report that every pound spent on a commissioner is a pound that is not spent on the delivery of frontline services, particularly when we're talking about some of the advocacy uh, commissioner proposals. We heard compelling evidence from the Human Rights uh, Commissioner's Office around the need to expand their remit and that that perhaps would be an alternative option to the creation of a number of new discrete commissioner rules. Maggie Chapman mentioned uh, previous SPCB proposals to reduce the number of commissioners to three. And I think we've, the landscape has moved on from a point where that would be easy to implement, but there are elements of that that should be resurrected. For example, why do we have two different commissions dealing with standards in public life? Surely just one would suffice in that particular area. 
Presiding officer, the Finance and Public Administration Committee is ultimately asking Parliament to trust us. We collected the evidence. We heard from a range of stakeholders, those who want to see new commissioners in their area of work, those who previously supported those proposals and do not, those who want to see reform of the existing landscape. And we gathered that evidence and then came to unanimous conclusions that point a way forward that I believe are in the best interest of Parliament and of the country as a whole. I hope at the end of the day today Parliament can unite around those conclusions and we can resolve this difficult issue rather than leave it for those who come after us. Thank you, Mr Greer. And we will now move to the open debate. I call Michelle Thompson to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Ms Thompson. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Each year, as we approach the budget, the, the finance uh, and, and uh, FPAC, I think I'll shorten it, two years the same refrain, broadly summarised as, we're great and we deserve more money. Each successive witness grouping says the same, and each successive group doesn't necessarily consider the bigger picture. And the strategic landscape, and I use that term very deliberately to ensure that we in this parliament take a long-range view for commissioners, seems to have been going the same way. I can imagine a multitude of areas where, if you consulted and asked the question, would you like a commissioner for X, Y or Z, people of course would agree. But as an existing postholder said, and I quote, as commissioners we seek frequent flyers looking for an angle in a particular issue, and sometimes the more angles you have, the more risks in the system and the more inefficiencies in the system. So I hope and suspect we all agree that public service reform is long overdue, that efficiency, effectiveness and coherence must be at the heart of our public spend, and that the processes of this place are still evolving. I was pleasantly surprised when receiving the usual briefings ahead of this debate and find that they too were supportive of the position adopted by our committee. And this provides a very welcoming backdrop to today's debate. So I plan just to pull out a few points in addition to the contributions from speakers thus far that I've found very heartening. First of all, it's worth reiterating the strong cross-party agreement in committee for a moratorium and the creation of any new commissioners. Now, bearing in mind, as of course is standard, this is a cross-party committee. We have very robust exchanges on, on a regular basis. And I think the strength of feeling within the commu uh, committee was quite heartening. Secondly, on democratic accountability of the various type of commissioners which are listed, investigatory, regulatory, complaints handling, specialist oversight and advocacy, we know, and it's already been brought out, that the new ones being proposed are mostly advocates. And I agree, but what are we as MSPs if not here to advocate? And a point succinctly made by Jackson Carlaw, when it comes to advocacy, this is what MSPs were elected to do. My third point concerns parliamentary accountability, with Professor Alan Page noting they're not really accountable to anyone. A strong view, I think, but I would certainly agree that the accountability is uncertain. And on scrutiny or lack of, we heard from the Law Society of Scotland noting that committee scrutiny can sometimes seem a little perfunctory. I think this may well win an understatement of the year award, given the large workload on all our committees. Fourthly, on cost. Now, the estimated cost for year 24 to 25 is certainly above 15 million, heading towards 16 million, I think. We don't have all the costs for any of the new commissioners, but it'd certainly be many, many millions on top of an already stretched budget. And the Finance Committee, ironically enough, of 2006 got a lot right with its tests for the creation of future bodies, namely clarity of remit, distinction between functions, complementarity, simplicity and accessibility, shared services and accountability. And the committee reiterates some of these in our recommendations, and rightly so. Fifthly, perhaps the most interesting area where consolidation may be considered is under rights. Now, the SHRC make a number of comments in their briefing, and principally that creating new commissions or commissioners could create significant challenges for the protection of human rights. They note it makes matters more complex for assessing justice and diluting human rights and various other points. However, what struck me was that their view that silos between the protection of rights 
could be an issue. Now, I make no apology for noting that this was an issue with the Gender Reform Bill in this Parliament. Balancing rights is messy and it's complex, but it's entirely necessary. So I thought that came through strongly. A final few comments on the dedicated committee that is pro proposed. Of course, it will be cross-party, and rightly so, but can the Minister confirm a bit of attention will be given to the skills of the members gathered on it? Because if we're going to do this work, it's an important piece of work, I think we want to give ourselves the best potential outcomes by getting the right people on it. Of course. Audrey Nicol. Thank the member for taking my intervention. Just on the point of skills, one thing that does slightly concern me is um, the way in which MSPs robustly scrutinise commissioners. And I just wonder if there's something in and around um, support for MSPs, given what has been reflected today as a very important role in terms of scrutinising commissioners. Isha Thompson. Yeah, it's an interesting point, and I think we can all concede we've been on different uh, committees where the quality of the scrutiny is variable and that can also be uh, influenced by the quality of the briefings that they're given. I have seen examples both in my time in Westminster and in indeed here where people have been offered either new members or refresher courses on how to do that, really get to the, the, the jugular. But adding on to that, I know that the member is interested in biometrics. I think one other area we also need to consider is specialist academic knowledge, which is very important as well, rather than we tend to be generalists in here. So I think my last point is that cross committees can be a very good thing. And in general terms, I think that this parliament could benefit from doing more of that type of working, because when we're focusing on this type of thing, we are all learning from each other and indeed the nature of these uh, debates. So that concludes my comments and uh, I look forward to the rest of the debate. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Thompson. I now call Jerry Balfour to be followed by Audrey Nicholl. Mr Balfour. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. I want to open my remarks with a statement that might surprise a number of my colleagues in the Chamber. I welcome today's debate and I welcome the report that is in response to it. Even though I am currently advocating for the establishment of a disability commissioner and this report is being used by some to justify opposition to it, I still welcome the Parliament reviewing its practice. I would even concede that there probably is a need to look at the use of commissioners and a full inquiry would be useful to see if it is in fact the most efficient model to help voiceless groups. But the key point that I want to make today, presiding officer, is that regardless of whether you think commissioners are worth the money, they are currently the choice of tool that this Parliament uses and will continue to be such until a replacement is established. And to be frank, disabled people cannot wait that long. We need a solution now. The situation isn't getting better. Every metric, if I can just make one more point, every metric, disabled people are being left behind more and more by the day. And every day we look to this Parliament to see it doing absolutely nothing to address that fact. In fact, in the last two months, we have seen two bills being withdrawn which would have helped disabled people. Other speakers have said that MSPs should be advocating for that. I'm afraid most of my colleagues have been absolutely silent. John Mason. I thank the member very much for giving way. W would he agree with the point that Ross Greer, I think, made earlier on, that really the problem is lack of money and there's a desire here to help disabled people? And it's not a commissioner that's missing, it's money that's missing. Jeremy uh, Clearly more money is required, but actually it's also having that voice. We have, the government has withdrawn two bills and almost there would be no coverage within the national press, national coverage. The Glasgow Disability Alliance including in Scotland, have ridiculed the government's plan for disability. And yet that has hardly been picked up in the main press. Disabled people are not being heard, Mr Mason. And not only that, they are now being told that while other groups enjoy a voice from a commissioner, they are being denied. Presiding officer, we do not know how long 
a broad commissioning review will take. I'm afraid I don't agree with Mr Gear. I do not think any substantial changes will happen in this Parliament. As I've said over and over, disabled people cannot afford to wait. And frankly, it is disc discriminatory to expect them to. I can think of no other marginalised group that would be expected to put up with this. In saying no to a disability commissioner, we are not only been closing the door on that possibility that the Parliament will pass on meaningful legislation to benefit disabled people this side of the election, but it will also force them to remain voiceless for the foreseeable future. President Officer, once again, I am not saying that commissioners are necessarily the best value for money, but I am recognising that they are the current method by which we give a voice and a champion to communities and groups who cannot muster their own. Ross Peer. I'm grateful to Mr Balfour for taking the intervention and I find myself agreeing with so much of what he's saying but the, the challenge here is every argument that he's just put forward for why disabled people need a commissioner could be put forward not just for older people and for every other group who currently have a proposal in front of us but 6, 12, 20 other groups in society who do not currently get what they deserve from the public sector. But surely we would all recognise that we cannot continue with an unlimited growth of this particular model. So does the member recognise that something needs to give here and eventually Parliament needs to take a consistent, holistic approach to that as the committee is trying to recommend? Jeremy Balfour. I absolutely accept that point. My point is, though, allow disabled people to be at the table to have that conversation. Don't let you allow them into the room. Because until we have a clear view of what the alternative will look like, we cannot cut off this lifeline for disabled people. I assume that the current commissioners will not cease operations until the review is complete. Of course not, because we understand that this would leave a number of vulnerable groups without a voice. It would leave a gap. And what of the fate of commissioners that is expected to pass through this parliament as part of the Victims, Witness and Justice Reform Bill in short order? Will it be accepted? If so, I would love for someone to stand up and tell me exactly why is it that disabled people that you believe don't deserve a commissioner, while those with victims do. President officer, disabled people cannot be forced to wait any longer. We cannot allow this report and the ongoing review to continue to rob them of their rights. Again, if a viable alternative is found by the inquiry, then I welcome it and would work to see disabled people have a seat at whatever table that might be. But until then, we need action now. We don't need to hear the solution is just around the corner or we should wait just a bit longer. We're not asking for a lot here. In the grand scheme of the budget, we're asking for a drop in the ocean. A commissioner is the least we can do for disabled people. The alternative is finish this parliamentary term five years without producing any meaningful legislation on disability. I don't think that's acceptable, and I don't think Parliament should either. In closing, presiding officer, I will be supporting the motion today because I believe that the review and process is important. But I would implore my colleagues not to use it as yet another excuse for robbing disabled people of a voice. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Balfour. I now call Audrey Nicholl to be followed by Colin Smith. Ms Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In Kern, I firstly commend the Finance Committee for producing a very detailed report on the Commissioner landscape that drills into, the, into a range of issues and makes timely recommendations, including, as the Committee's motion states, calling for a root and branch review and a clear strategic framework um, to be established to underpin the landscape. So in my short contribution, I'll reflect on some of the points outlined in the report by referring to the evidence taken on the proposal for a new commissioner, and secondly, I'll draw on the evidence given by an existing commissioner. So I was particularly interested in the committee's consideration of how commissioners fit within existing democratic accountability structures, which has been referenced already. This is particularly relevant given the increase in the number of new commissioners being proposed, including a victims commissioner, as we've heard. And I was pleased to give evidence to the Finance Committee 
On the Criminal Justice Committee's scrutiny of the proposal and the challenges faced by the committee, which I convene, in making some sense of that evidence and reaching agreement on recommendations. And I note at the time of the Criminal Justice Committee scrutiny, members were unaware of the existence of the ministerial control framework, which may have been of assistance to members. And I am still slightly unclear uh, on how the publication of the framework should now be applied, especially at this committee stage of scrutiny of a new Commissioner uh, proposal. Uh, and for the record, my comments today reflect a personal uh, viewpoint. The, the proposal for a Victims Commissioner arises from a perceived need for an independent voice for victims, putting victims at the heart of the justice system. Now, support varied. There was strong sense of that the status quo for victims is not acceptable, and a Commissioner has an important role in changing that. And it was of no surprise, of course, uh, that cost was raised as an issue with a suggestion that the funding required could be put to better use. As one witness stated, they would rather fund legal representation for survivors than a commissioner. There was an expectation and perhaps some confusion uh, among some witnesses that the Commissioner could intervene in individual cases. This is not, in fact, the case. But this highlighted the need for real clarity on the individual roles and responsibilities of Commissioners. Would a Commissioner interfere with the ability of experienced third sector organisations to engage directly with the Scottish Government and other justice bodies where strong relationships already exist? Scotland is con considered to be leading in this regard. And similarly, would there be a synergy between a Commissioner for Victims and the likes of HMIs for policing and prosecutions and also the PERC, the Police Investigations and Review Commissioner? Overlap was also raised, spoken about already uh, in the debate, for example, the existing role of the Children's Commissioner in representing the rights of children as victims. And I hope it is of, of some interest to Jeremy Balfour that on the basis of the evidence heard, the Criminal Justice Committee remains to be convinced of a strong case for a Victims Commissioner, and it recommended that if a Commissioner post be established, it should be for a time-limited period to allow for an assessment of the value of the role. I note the Minister's response to Martin Whitfield's intervention seeking uh, clarity on the status of Commissioner's posts currently the subject of live scrutiny, and that was very helpful. By contrast, the Scottish Biometrics Commissioner, uh, which is scrutinised by the uh, Criminal Justice Committee, fulfils a fairly clear function supporting lawful practices relating to biometric data, such as fingerprints and DNA. And I note the excellent evidence of the Biometrics Commissioner, uh, Dr Brian Plasto, who described the model of commissioners in Scotland as having evolved organically over time. In his case, following controversies over what was described uh, at the time as a biometrics wild west. And he stressed the importance of commissioners' independence, sharing services to ensure best value, and the importance of avoiding scrutiny purely through the lens of cost, all uh, points that have been referenced already this afternoon. And I do not disagree with Dr Plasto's view on the scrutiny role of the SPCB, Parliament and committees being a bit of a mixed picture at the moment, with scope for it to be far more proactive, especially that of committees. And I was particularly interested to note Dr Plasto's evidence to the Finance Committee regarding post-implementation review, saying, and I quote, often these posts arise because of a particular wicked issue, a controversy, but 20 years down the line that might no longer be relevant. So I think there needs to be a more systematic look at how this entire landscape fits together. And I note the committee's consideration of the merits of a sunset clause in enabling legislation. The final point that I would uh, make relates to the need to ensure elected members fully understand their role in scrutinising the role and function of commissioners and holding them to account, a point that I have in intervened on my colleague uh, Michelle Thompson on, in particular where a commissioner's role is specialist or technical. 
So, to conclude, I, can, I commend the uh, Finance Committee in their work, and I very much look forward to following the progress of the review, should it be agreed today. Thank you, Ms Nicholl. I now call Colin Smith to be followed by Emma Harper. Mr Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, my apologies for missing the first few seconds of the opening um, speech. Of all the substantial issues facing our public finances, I do have to confess at being surprised at the priority given to this issue by the Finance Committee, and even more surprised that, in my view, they should propose a motion that does go way beyond the Committee's remit. As members know, there are proposals for commissioners from government, from individual members, including myself and an older persons commissioner, that have received support, are being developed and, in some cases, are before committees. Yet the Finance Committee motion today seeks to undermine the work of those committees and, in doing so, I believe undermine this Parliament. President officer, the Government and any member has the right to bring forward legislation within the power of this Parliament at any time and they have the right to have that legislation considered on its merits by our agreed processes. No committee, this chamber, should seek to veto that democratic right. And I have to say, the government... Sorry, I'll give way to... to, to John Mason. I thank the member for giving way. He mentions the processes. Would he accept that the processes are not working at the moment, that something is out of control? Colin Smith? I, I'm not aware of any proposal from the Finance Committee that says the way in which we determine legislation this Parliament is not working. And that's the point I'm making. But what the Finance Committee are doing is seeking to undermine those agreed processes whereby a member can bring forward a bill, have it scrutinised by Parliament, a decision being made. And a moratorium takes that right away from members. And I have to say, the Government amendment isn't clear as it does appear to propose a moratorium on commissioners, just not ones in published bills. It seems the concerns over the lack of a strategic framework aren't concerns if the commissioners are already proposed in a government bill. I'll take our intervention at that point. Hopefully Minister? some clarity. Yeah, just to have clarity, the government supports a moratorium. The government also recognises that bills that are uh, proceeding through Parliament, it is rightly for Parliament and its committees to make a decision on how those proceed. Colin Smith. The government amendment does say in those circumstances we should respect the lead committee's role in scrutinising legislation within the remits. The problem is the government seemed to be suggesting that the same respect isn't given to the right of a member who's got a proposal for a bill, has consulted on that proposal, has received cross-party support for that proposal, but the bill is in the process of being finalised and not yet published. That same right should be given to those proposals, not just the ones that are already in legislation. The Government's amendment seems to be suggesting one rule for bills that are already published and another rule for bills that may be published in the next few weeks. And I believe that that's wrong. In the case of my own proposed bill, that, co that consultation took place with over a thousand people given their view. That's in contrast, I have to say, to the very small number of people the Finance Committee consulted for their report. So there are serious questions, presiding officer, to be asked about the practical implications of both the committee motion, which doesn't even include, I have to say, a timescale for its proposed moratorium, and indeed also the government's amendment. The decision by members of the Finance Committee to bring forward the proposed moratorium and the government's response and their amendment is in danger, in my view, of overshadowing what are some valid points within the committee's report, including the need for that overarching framework, which I support, and the need to tackle concerns over the budget pressures on the SPCB. The Finance Committee rightly acknowledged their failure and that of other committees of this Parliament also to properly scrutinise the role of SPCB bodies. But we don't need a selective moratorium to agree to take action, and we don't need a moratorium to agree that committees should review their work plans and processes to put in place appropriate scrutiny sessions of commissioners. We should also accept that this failure... I will indeed, yes. Yeah. No, for what time, yeah. I am grateful to Mr Smith for taking intervention. I would pose the same question to him that I do to Mr Balfour, because I have sympathy with the position that he is in here, and a compelling case can be made for the, the need for older people to have a commissioner, but does he recognise that that same case could be made for dozens of other groups in society? I presume he would not want us to be in a situation where there are almost as many commissioners as there are MSPs, and therefore a holistic approach needs to be taken to this, rather than Parliament being put in the position of deciding on a group-by-group -group basis who does and does not deserve advocacy. Colin Smith. I have to say, I'm not going to have that debate on an older person's commissioners today, because sadly, 
we do not have time. But I believe that members have the right to scrutinise any proposal on the merits of that particular proposal and why. There may be a particular argument for one Commissioner, but not an argument for another. But what we appear to be having here is the Finance Committee saying there should be a moratorium in having that debate altogether. And I actually also think we should accept that the failure of scrutiny goes way beyond the very small number of SPCB bodies. It also includes, for example, the way we scrutinise the growing number of quangos who have budgets of hundreds of millions of pounds that go way in excess of the budgets of commissioners. I read last week the Scotsman exposed the fact that quangos spend £120 million on public affairs bodies alone. That's about ten times the budget of any commissioners. Thank you time. very much. I don't know um, when the member came into, the, uh, into the, the chamber this afternoon, but if he was here for my remarks, he would have heard me very, very clearly say that the £18 million pounds we spend on commissioners is a very small part of the bigger picture, and the government is absolutely focused on the wider public body landscape and uh, around £5 billion pounds that we spend on back offices across uh, wider public bodies and the Scottish Government. He can rest assured on that, and indeed, I encourage the committee to take up a piece of work in that regard as well. I would certainly encourage that as well. It comes back to my original point. Why is there a focus on the relatively small budget of commissioners, but no effective scrutiny on the far wider budget of our quangos? And that's a piece of work I would certainly support, and certainly would show that the Finance Committee are serious about scrutinising huge sums of public sector spending. The committee argue also that the advocacy role of commissioners is for MSPs to carry out. Of course, advocacy is our job. I would be the first to say that Parliament has not fulfilled this role effectively when it comes to older people. There wasn't, for example, a single mention of older people in the most recent programme for government. But, President Officer, there's a very real difference between the role of an MSP and the impartial advice of an expert commissioner that helps enhance and inform our advocacy role as an MSP. Even a cursory glance at the extensive work of the Older People's Commissioners in Wales and Northern Ireland and my proposal for a commissioner in Scotland for older people shows their role goes way beyond advocacy. And in response to the views of the Scottish Human Rights Commission, the role also goes way beyond just that human rights factor as well. My proposed Older Persons Commissioner would have a key role challenging age discrimination. They'd have the power to conduct investigations into how service providers take account of the rights and interests of older people and decisions they make. They'd have a clear role to provide advice on policy making across government as it considers the long-term needs of our ageing population. And I think that's crucial. The growing ageing population makes that case alone, I think, for an older people's commissioner. Crucially, however, an older people's commissioner would be independent. They'd be free of party or government bias. They wouldn't come and go with an election cycle. They would be a permanent independent force, championing the rights of older people, of course, but also working on improving the lives of older people and protecting their rights on a daily basis. That independence is one of the reasons why I believe over 90 per cent of the organisations and individuals who took part in my consultation on an older persons commissioner backed my proposal. It is why independent polling shows not only does 90 per cent of people over 65 support an older persons commissioner, so does over 70 per cent of people of all agencies. That polling also Mr. shows... Mr Smith, I have been generous, but please uh, okay, bring your remarks. That polling also shows significant support or, or concerns that we are not dealing with older people's issues on a regular basis. President officer, at the time of COVID, I kept asking myself that when all the big decisions were being made, who independent of government was championing the human rights of older people? And the answer was no one. Now, some members may disagree with my proposal for a bill. But what Mr the Smith, committee... really, you will need to conclude. Okay, well, conclude. I hope the Finance Committee do not propose that motion today or pass that motion today that will undermine the right to, at the very least, have that debate on commissioners Thank you. in the months Thank ahead. Thank you, Mr Smith. Thank you. I now call Emma Harper to be followed by John Mason. Ms Harper. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate and start by thanking the Finance and Public Administration Committee members and the clerks for producing the report and for carrying out this important inquiry. And as well, I want to acknowledge all the witnesses who provided evidence. And I wish to remind Chamber that I previously was one of the selection panel members for the Biometrics Commissioner, and I am currently a panel member for the selection of the Patient Safety Commissioner. 
Scotland's Commissioner of Landscape is a subject I have discussed on numerous occasions recently, both with members of the public and with my own office team. There are clearly many benefits to commissioners. However, in recent years, I agree with the committee that the landscape has become cluttered. One of the issues which was raised with me recently is the overlap of commissioners and, and, and the roles, and Ross Greer has highlighted this in naming individual groups. And so one of the questions that was posed to me was, which commissioner would be the right commissioner for a person who's got a disability, who's neurodiverse, who's elderly, and was the victim of a crime? So it is a challenge when we're talking about how do we represent and support all these different people who rightly do need to be supported. And you know, the remits of... Um, sure, I'll give way. Jerry Balfour. Where does a disabled person go now? Emma Harper. I didn't, I didn't catch that. Sorry. Well, let me Balfour. clarify. You've, said, you've given an example. You said there's different options. I'm asking at the moment, where does a disabled person go now to get their voice heard in the rich crowded landscape? So the... Oh, was so the chair, Emma Harper? Oh, Apologies, presiding officer. So, right now, so in our scrutiny for the National Care Service Bill, we've had representatives from disabled groups come directly to us to provide evidence, and then we scrutinise them. There's also a Human Rights Commissioner. There's also their own MSP as well. So, there are routes already in place that can help members of lots of different. So, I'm not just speaking about uh, persons with a disability. You know, the, the remits of the many commissioners do have overlaps. Overlap is mentioned 17 times in the committee's report. So I therefore welcome that the government in principle agrees with the committee that a moratorium on the creation of a new commissioner should be in place until a root and branch review of the commissioner landscape is undertaken. I'm conscious Mr Hoy wants in. Just let me finish this one sentence and then I will let you in. So a root and branch review of the commissioner landscape I think does need to be undertaken and colleagues have described that root and branch in their reviews as well. Thank Always you. Always through the chair, Craig Coyne. I, I thank Emma Harper for giving way. Is perhaps the, uh, the fact that the question that was asked by uh, Jeremy Balfour a difficult one to ask because there is, there is not, presently a lack of clarity about what the function of the commissioners are. If it's an upholding rights, then surely it's the Human Rights Commissioner. But if it's an advocacy function, and we're saying that we're not convinced that commissioners should be there to be uh, advocates per se, because the civil society groups to do that, so shouldn't we be looking at what the function of the, commission, uh, the commissioners are before we start looking as to who should go to them and for what? Emma Harper. So it's pretty reasonable to like, suggest that we've, we've seen how different uh, commissioners have an advocacy role or at different roles, and, and that is something that seems to be um, not as clear in the understanding of members of the public. So that's why I think a bit of a review should be taken forward so there is more clarity about what each of the commissioner's roles are, whether it is advocacy or not. So, presiding officer, as I mentioned, duplication in functions and duties of commissioners in Scotland has been a topic of concern and the overlap and duplication of functions among different commissioners across other organisations in Scotland, particularly as the number of com commissioners is proposed to continue to grow. So stakeholders have raised concerns about the complexity of the current landscape and the cost of the public purse of the appointment of commissioners, along with their offices, support staff and other associated administrative costs. So with new bodies potentially adding to this, some argue for a broader approach that prioritises human rights, as I've mentioned, and equity for all, rather than creating multiple commissioners for specific groups. One of the areas of concerns that I've discussed with constituents and others is the potential democratic deficit which can be caused by the use of commissioners. Par paragraph 142 of the report discusses democratic accountability concerns. And some argue that it outsources the decisions and policy direction of the government away from ministers who are democratically accountable through elections. The committee's report broadly agreed with these points and found, and I quote, that there is a need to ensure that commissioners deliver value for money and effectively address the needs of the population, including addressing the potential risks associated with duplication and working towards enhancing the efficiency of commissioners. Again, it is welcome that the Scottish Government has accepted this point and that it can be reflected upon when looking at how we move forward. My final point, presiding officer, relates to the financial aspects of the commissioners. You know, it, it, right now we are in 
challenging budgeting times, even though we've had a budget yesterday. But as the committee report helpfully points out, the Scottish Parliament corporate body supports these independent office holders and sets the terms and conditions of their appointment and annual budgets. I won't rehearse the figures again, but what I would like to say in conclusion is that I welcome the Scottish Government supports the intention of the committee's report and a drive to improve governance, accountability and efficiency across the parliamentary com commissioner landscape. The Scottish Government has already adopted a position that any new public body should be created as a last resort and the Cabinet has approved the use of this ministerial control framework. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Ms Harper. And I now call John Mason. Mr Mason. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And as others have said, the Finance Committee has spent quite a lot of time on this subject since I think it was Jackson Carlaw in the first place and the corporate body who first raised it with us at budget time. This topic is linked to the wider question of public sector reform. Scotland is a relatively small country and we should be able to operate with a simpler system and have fewer public bodies than larger European countries like, say, France, England or Germany. And yet there tends to be a feeling, and I see it across the parties, that if England or Wales or Northern Ireland has a commissioner for a particular subject, then we need to have one too. I believe we need to break away from this way of thinking uh, and be more prepared to do things in our own way, which suits Scotland and our population size. Other, as others have also said, it has become the tendency in recent times that where there is a problem highlighted, for example, the needs of autistic people or disabled people not being met, then in order to show we are doing something, we create a commissioner. This certainly sounds like a nice and supportive thing to do, and who would be hard-hearted enough to oppose a commissioner for children or animals or those who are terminally ill? Yet maybe a commissioner is not always the best answer to these real issues. Perhaps the problem is lack of money or something else. If the problem is lack of money, then having a commissioner can make things worse by diverting resources away from frontline services, or even diverting resources away from another sector which does not have a commissioner. The committee did not want to take a view on individual supported bodies. However, I would like to use an example myself and suggest that older people do not need a commissioner. I guess I am taking a risk using this example at all. However, I am part of that sector, being 67 myself, and also I am not standing for election again. Old, older people already have very active advocacy groups in the likes of Age Scotland, Independent Age and the Scottish Older People's Assembly, not to mention groups which have a strong focus on older people like Alzheimer Scotland, Men's Shed and Generations Working Together. Now, I have a very high opinion of Age Scotland, for one. They are a strong, well-financed organisation and they often give professional, professional evidence two parliamentary committees, including the Finance Committee, on the budget. So why would older people need another advocate when they already have several very good ones? Older people are usually the most committed to voting in elections, and as a result, their voice is clearly heard, which I suggest means that most political parties do prioritise older people. For example, the triple lock on pensions meant an extra £900 in April. Now, I fully accept there is pensioner poverty, and we need to address that, for example, keeping the winter fuel payment and reorganising pension credit so that so many do not miss out. But I would suggest the problem is not the lack of a commissioner. The main problem is the lack of money. But it, uh, yes. Consman? I'm sure older people um, who noticed there wasn't a single mention of older people in the government's programme for government will find it a surprise that they're such a high priority for the government. But why does John Mason think that all the organisations he just listed there support an older person's commissioner if they've all got plenty of advocacy ability at the moment? John Mason? Because everyone wants their sector to have a stronger voice, so everybody wants a commissioner for everything. And I mean, we're, we're only, we've mentioned about 12 so far, but where would we stop? Will we stop at 20 or 40 or 60 or 100? I mean, there is no limit to this unless we get some kind of system uh, into, into place. Now, it's particularly interesting to hear from two former MSPs who had proposed new commissioners when they were in Parliament, but have now changed their minds and have concluded that this would not have been the best option. So we have had this piecemeal approach to increasing commissioners, but what should be the way forward? And there are a variety of views. 
Personally, I would probably favour expanding the role of Scottish Human Rights Commission uh, and perhaps having one or two others, as the SPCB uh, promise, uh, previously had proposed. Now, that would require new legislation, and I accept that would be a major change for SHRC as well. However, that would give them greater powers and flexibility, including potentially focusing on one subject for a few years and then switching emphasis to another subject. Now, assuming we continue to have some or more commissioners, we need to be clearer what involvement we want committees to have. We heard from some, and I think specifically the Biometrics Commissioner, that they are seldom asked to appear before a committee. And that is probably because the relevant committee is pressed for time and it is unrealistic to expect the corporate body to oversee more and more. Professor Alan Page described how the bodies are established and, quote, but they, they then occupy a certain no man's land where they are not really accountable to anybody, unquote. The importance of independence is often stressed, and I agree with that. However, there are different ways of achieving independence, and I think the HM Inspectorate of the Constabulary and HM Inspectorate of Prisons are accountable to government, but I think are widely accepted to operate independently. So commissioners does not need to have a whole organisation of their own in order to be independent. Therefore, in conclusion, I fully support the committee recommendations that no new commissioners or similar should be set up until there has been a thorough review carried out by a dedicated committee and building on a report. I'm happy to support the Green Amendment, which adds a timescale. I could possibly live with the SNP Amendment, although I do not think it is ideal and allows a loophole, so I would plan to vote against it if there is a vote. However, the Labour Amendment is the weakest of the lot and is the closest to the status quo and goes against the evidence we heard at committee, and I would urge members to reject it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mason. We will now move to closing speeches, and I call on Ross Grew to close on behalf of Scottish Greens. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I do think it's fitting that we started this week with a debate on fiscal sustainability and are closing uh, with this one. I appreciate that Conservative colleagues gave us the opportunity in the middle to let off a bit of steam and have a, a good uh, partisan knockabout. But both of these debates are opportunities for Parliament to come together and recognise that we are capable of doing difficult things if we are brave enough to do so together. And it is important that degree of unanimity. You know, Michelle Thompson I think, made the pretty compelling point that if any group of people are asked, do you want a commissioner to advocate for your interests? Do you want more of a voice? Of course, they will say yes, but Parliament has a job to look at this in the round. And I really appreciated Jeremy Balfour's speech, and I welcome his support for the motion from the, the committee. Um, I don't think, though, that if this is agreed, there is no prospect of progress until the next Parliament. The moratorium proposed by the committee, which my amendment clarifies, is only until June of next year. That absolutely does not stop bills such as his own from being agreed in this Parliament. We are not prejudging the outcome of that committee uh, process. Uh, and I also really appreciated Audrey Nichols' contribution. I'm sorry that I couldn't take her intervention. I think the experience of the committee dealing with the proposal for a victims commissioner is a particularly interesting one. I've got to be honest, my reading of the committee report was that it was an invitation for the government to remove that proposal from the bill, and I do think the government needs to give that consideration. I think there is a way, though, to maintain that as an option whilst proceeding with that bill, because there are other incredibly important provisions in it that we do not wish to delay. You know, one uh, potential solution that occurred to me, and I admit to not being an expert in that bill, uh, is to uh, include in the bill uh, ministerial regulation making power, allowing for the creation of that commissioner through secondary legislation at a later point, if Parliament so agrees. Um, Sarah Boyack made the very helpful point that there are different kinds of commissioners and absolutely the review if Parliament agrees to it today should absolutely take that into account uh, but it should capture all of the different proposed and current types of commissioner categories of commissioner in its scope there should be a holistic review but recognizing the differences between the proposals that are on offer uh, the proposals that were submitted to our committee inquiry from the human rights Commission uh, to strengthen their role, I think, are an attractive alternative to the creation of new uh, discrete commissioners. But there are other options as well. Stronger legislation in the first place, for example, uh, compelling public bodies to give uh, greater regard to the national performance framework, I think would improve outcomes and in many cases avoid the need uh, for challenge to those bodies later down the line. 
Yes. Sarah Boyack. Actually, that is exactly what uh, my bill has been considering, and the consultation was looking at it's not enough just to have a, a duty. You've got to think about how it's going to be monitored and implemented, and that independent approach of government was one of the key issues that lots of organisations very strongly welcomed. Ross Grew. I'm grateful to Sarah Boyack for putting that on the record. I'm going to come specifically to her bill later um, on. Uh, but I thought Amy Harper's point around democratic accountability is one that we do need to draw out far more on, particularly because the groups that we're talking about here who either already have commissioners or who are proposed commissioners for are not monolithic. These groups do not all speak with one voice on absolutely every issue. And it is perfectly legitimate for us to question the democratic legitimacy of positions advanced by particularly the advocacy form of commissioners. We all have every right to advocate for any position that we so wish as a result of the democratic mandate that we have received. And whilst commissioners play an incredibly important role, those democratic safeguards are absolutely critical. And the growth of commissioners weakens the potential for those democratic safeguards. I'm taking intervention on that point. There's Robert Robert accept, however, that there's a huge difference between an independent commissioner who has no policy-making powers but is there to give an independent voice and expert opinion and an MSP who ultimately we will still take the decision when it comes to policy development. Ross Grew. I think Mr Smith touches on the important uh, point of there are differences between the different types of uh, commissioners that are proposed. Some are proposed, some of the existing commissioners are purely uh, advocacy based. Some are proposed that we would have statutory functions, the ability to, to investigate, uh, for example. The key point here is we are trying to take a consistent approach rather than the ever-expanding growth of different types of commissioners with overlapping uh, and sometimes duplicating remits. John Mason's uh, joke about how he was not standing again and was able to, to uh, be perhaps more honest than might otherwise have been possible about the older persons commissioner, again, though, I think does reveal something that we need to consider in this debate. This debate gives us the opportunity to consider the commissioner landscape as a whole. As I uh, responded to Martin Whitfield earlier, if we take this on a proposal-by-proposal -proposal approach, let's be honest, it is harder to be honest as MSPs, because nobody wants to be the politician that tells a sympathetic group in society, you are not getting what you think you need. So this debate gives us the opportunity to move out of that space and take a more considered approach in the round. The Green Amendment is intended as a reassurance, simply to clarify the limited timescale of this. I'd honestly hoped that there would be no amendments to this afternoon's debate, but when I heard that others were bringing theirs forward, I thought that this one might be useful to emphasise that this process should be complete by June of next year. The, the Greens can't support the Labour Amendment. We think it is important to agree with the committee's uh, recommendations, not to note them, and that a moratorium is required. Uh, but in the spirit of some of the previous debates this week where uh, we're all agreeing with uh, people that we don't uh, always or often do, I do want to agree with uh, Colin Smith on a point around scrutiny. This Parliament is not good enough at scrutinising either legislation, post-legislative scrutiny, or the functions of public bodies. But I would challenge, though, on this question of whether the Finance Committee has gone beyond our remit. As Michelle Thompson pointed out, we are this session the Finance and Public Administration Committee. So this report, this uh, inquiry, was entirely within our remit. It's not the Finance and Public Administration Committee's remit to reform parliamentary scrutiny as a whole, but Parliament as a whole should absolutely be considering that question, because I agree with Mr Smith on that Mr point. Greer, please conclude. I will come to a conclusion, President Officer. I think the, the Scottish Government amendment, whilst not great, if it is limited to the two uh, Commissioner proposals that are currently before Parliament, uh, is something that, whilst not enthusiastic about, we wouldn't necessarily uh, oppose. But uh, as I said in opening, presiding Officer, this is an opportunity uh, for Parliament to prove that we are capable of doing difficult things Please if we like do conclude. them together. Thank, Thank you. you. I now call Martin Whitfield to close on behalf of Scottish Labour. Up to six minutes, please. I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. It has been a most interesting um, debate this afternoon that was, I think, prompted firstly by um, a very well-considered and thought-through report for which I thank the committee, the clerks, and actually those who contributed. And will confess to having spent uh, an interesting hour or so uh, in front of the committee and answering questions. And I think what this debate has shown probably more than anything else, is that there is a need to review 
the Commissioner's landscape from the point of view of getting an understanding as to what on earth the Commissioner actually is, all the way through to can we create a model that would allow serious consideration should the need be to expand the um, landscape of commissioners. Um, some of the comments about individual commissioners I think have both been helpful um, and to some extent less helpful, I'll leave it at that. But one of the things that I'm glad that was picked up is the fact that the commissioners are independent and one of the strongest virtues of the Commissioner landscape is their independence both from the Scottish Government and from the Scottish Parliament. And there were some interesting discussions which show there is a fluidity of the use of language with regard to that about who holds account and how they hold account. And one of the other points that was raised was with regard to the, the, the concept of the overlap of the advocacy role of commissioners with the advocacy role of MSPs. And again, I would do that marvellous little typed bit, refer to previous paragraph about independence, because there is a challenge as to what independence means um, within this chamber. And I think that's important. I do want to concentrate um, my short remarks in relation to a number of matters. The first with regard to the SPCB. Um, and can I thank very much the contribution um, uh, from, from the SPCB, both here and also their contribution in the preparation of the report. Because I think it is right that we recognise and remember that the corporate body was created by the Scotland Act, Section 21. Its role is set out in Schedule 2. It sits in that piece of legislation. It is funded by a block grant that comes from the UK Parliament Consolidated Fund into the Scottish Consolidated Fund with some additional extras kindly provided by the Scottish Government by way of receipts where work is undertaken on their behalf. Having set the factual background, I think Maggie Chapman was, and, and put it far more eloquently than I, that there is a challenge with the expectation that rests on SP, SPCB, both as a resource, as a fund of knowledge and wisdom about certain aspects. And the SPCB have, and I think rightly so, defended the extent to which their um, interjection into our independent commissioners exists. Uh, but I do think that there is a gap between that and sometimes the request and requirement both from independent commissioners and those that work for them. And I am more than content that um, a specific committee set up to look at this can deal with that matter because I think going forward, um, although it may seem small um, and hopefully one that doesn't raise its quote ugly unquote head, when it does it is a very challenging situation it needs to be dealt with. I then come to the actual motions that sit before us. Um, and it is interesting, and again, listening to the debate this afternoon, about the role of Bureau, SPCB, and this chamber. Um, I may get monotonous doing this, but understanding orders, it's for the Bureau to establish the remit, the membership, and the duration of a committee. And any member can bring a motion to this chamber asking the Bureau to make that consideration. And it's interesting because we talked, and my apologies, I can't remember which member it was, talked about the need for a certain level of skill perhaps to serve on a committee. That already exists within our standing orders under Rule 6.3.4, which says that a member's qualifications and experience to sit on a committee should be taken into account if the member gives that information to the Bureau. I think uh, a standing order celebrated more in its absence of use um, rather than the value that it really rests with. But there are procedures. And one of the interesting challenges I have at an intellectual level is I'm not sure that the motion, no matter how amended or going past, is actually a request from a member to set up a committee. So we then move to the question of to what is the binding effect of the, the motions? And it's for that reason that Scottish Labour put in the amendment that you see printed in Sarah Boyack's name. And 
the synopsis of which is to include a termination date, which I understand, uh, I, I see that the, the, the Green Amendment is done, and I'm grateful for that, and we will be supporting that um, today. But it removes this question of a moratorium, which we haven't really had successfully answered about what we mean, um, whether a bill is in or outside of that. And also, I think there is a real challenge to say, can the Parliament even bind itself doing that, other than in stage one debates where we will say there is a moratorium? And I'm happy to give way to Ross Greer. Ross Greer. I'm conscious of time. Thank you. If I, if I can be very brief. So my understanding of the Government Amendment is that it would preclude the Victims uh, Commissioner proposal and the Disability Victims, uh, uh, sorry, Disabled People's uh, Commissioner proposal. Is the Labour Party's position that if passed it would pre uh, preclude all current proposals, i.e. it would only be a moratorium on proposals that no one has even mentioned yet? In closing, Mr Whitfield. In, in, in closing it and in short. And that was the reason for my intervention on, uh, on the Minister towards it, um, about what the meaning of it was. Because I am concerned well, what the binding nature of this motion is in any event. So, in conclusion, Presiding Officer, we very much welcome the request to investigate the landscape, both the historic, the current and the future landscape of commissioners and as a cross chamber I think we are unified in that. It should be carried out quickly and succinctly, it should take evidence from a lot of places and learn because we need to provide guidance and support ideally this session but to how we develop and the role of commissioners going forward. I'm grateful, presiding officer. <coughs> Thank you and I call on Jamie Halker Johnston, up to <coughs> six minutes please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I take this opportunity, as a, someone who was a member of the Finance Committee during the inquiry, to thank, as others have done, all those who gave evidence to the committee, who shared their concerns and their experiences of Scotland's commissioner landscape, our former MSP colleagues, our advisers, and, of course, our committee clerks for all their efforts in putting together the report. This report is, as the Deputy Convener, Michael Mara, rightly said in his opening speech, a considered and comprehensive piece of work but that it is not intended to be a report card on the current existing bodies or individual commissioners. The inquiry was focused on ensuring that the model of the future delivers both value for money, given these bodies are now costing the taxpayer over £15 million a year, with at least one of the bodies costing seven times more than was originally forecast. And of course, and perhaps most importantly, that they deliver the best outcomes, and outcomes is an area others have touched on, uh, and I will come back to. Our report pulled no punches. The committee found that the current commissioner landscape was, quote, not fit for purpose, that a lack of clear and coherent framework meant an ad hoc approach had become the norm and that individual bodies were left with varying functions and powers. We heard of concerns about duplication and overlap between bodies, but also that while there was some collaboration between some bodies, more could be done to bring together back office and office sharing, and that was welcomed by the committee. But it is clear, as has been raised repeatedly by others in this debate, that scrutiny has been lacking. Mm -hmm. That a serious overhaul is needed to ensure, as the report states, and I quote, overall accountability, budget setting, and scrutiny mechanisms are clearer, more robust, joined up, and transparent. Professor Alan Page of the University of Dundee said SC SCPB supported bodies are, and I quote, set established, the parliament funds them, sets their budget, appoints people to them, and all the rest but then they occupy a certain no man's land where they are not really accountable to, anyone, uh, to anybody and no one is responsible for saying whether or not the system works or whether it should be rationalised and so on. But this scrutiny role is one which seems, as we've heard today, to have outgrown the corporate body's capacity and resource to deliver. And so the oversight and governance of supported bodies, something that is so important to ensure value for money for the taxpayer, but also those outcomes that these bodies are supposed to be delivering, are met. So who does provide the security? As the report made clear, and as we will all be aware, there are already capacity issues where other committees of this parliament have a role. If I can turn to some of the other members' speeches, Michael Mara, speaking on behalf of the Finance Committee, rightly and importantly raised concerns that some current and former commissioners have, uh, some concerns some current and former commissioners have with the increasing number of commissioners. Craig Hoy recognised the recommendations on the role sunset clauses could play in ensuring the Commissioner landscape doesn't become stale and ensuring that there was a clear focus on what new bodies were brought in to achieve and whether or not they achieve those objectives. Um, I welcome the positive way in which the Minister, Ivan McKee, has engaged with the report and the commitment to reforming the public sector, which, if it is delivered through significant action, 
will, I'm sure, be welcome on these benches. I think Jeremy Balfour made an extremely important contribution because it should remind us all that behind the decisions that we make here in this chamber, there are groups and individuals who live their lives with serious challenges and who are looking for us to bring forward solutions. That is why it is disappointing that it has taken so long for Parliament to look again seriously at this issue and why resolving it, exposing the failures and bringing around a better system is so important. But of course, if that happens and there is a moratorium as the committee recommends, that risks leaving people in limbo, as Jeremy highlighted. And is that really fair? Or as Sarah Boyack suggested, is there a risk of throwing the baby out with the bathwater? I would only say that I'm sure we would all agree that it is outcomes that are important. And when there are serious concerns, whether those outcomes are being actually measured or scrutinized in existing cases, there is the risk that pushing ahead with more of the same will not bring around the real change that we probably all agree is needed. Mm. Ross Greer was right that this is an important debate, as were his suggestions that it should be more focused on outcomes, and that because of the lack of a structure and how commissioners are established, no commissioner has the same roles or the same responsibilities. And he and, John Mason, and as John Mason mentioned, the concern that every pound spent on commissioners is a pound that cannot be spent on frontline services. John Mason, in his intervention, raised reasonable concerns that if those larger organisations, those already with the largest resources and loudest voices, that have an advantage in pushing for new commissioners in their area. Presiding officer, this is, of course, not the first time the Finance Committee has looked into Scotland's commissioner landscape, but creating new commissioners has become the go-to solution for dealing with systemic failures in delivering public services, failures that could be more effectively dealt with by other models. Action and reform is long overdue. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Ivan McKee, up to seven minutes, Minister. Seven minutes. Thank you, President Officer. And um, just to reflect, this is the third for a triple header of debates on finance related issues this uh, week. And I've had the pleasure in speaking in all three of them for the government. Um, President Officer, members around this chamber and parties often call for. Um, uh, as to address uh, public service reform. Um, and it's important to recognise that that often called for um, requirement um, is uh, taken forward and how people react when we have something specific in front of them that directly addresses that agenda. It's a measure indeed of how seriously members in the chamber uh, take that agenda because it's easy to call for change. Uh, but it's difficult to implement it when, uh, when the time comes in delivering on that agenda. A point that's been well made by John Mason, by Ross Gear, and by others. Um, so I can confirm this government is absolutely committed to delivering on that public service reform agenda um, and delivering the change that is necessary. Um, savings have already been delivered. Um, I can give some examples of what we've done in the estates agenda, saving £36 million to the action we've taken in the last year um, and much, much more and we'll be publishing data um, shortly uh, on that. Um, but the context of uh, the debate today is important in that regard and has already been pointed out by myself and others. The amounts of money we're talking about, well, uh, reasonable in, uh, uh, with regards to the cost of commissioners and new commissioners is but uh, the tip of the iceberg when we consider the broader uh, public uh, body spend and Scottish Government spend. But it's hugely important um, and I believe it's well within the remit of the, the finance and Public Administration Committee to address these issues because it sets the tone, as was called for by the, the Committee for Government to take a lead on, and I believe we've done that, um, uh, integrates, uh, uh, shortly, integrates a process whereby uh, we have a mechanism uh, is established for reviewing um, the, 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 the establishment of new bodies, and it's done so in a cross-party space, which is hugely important to take forward this agenda. Yeah. Martin Whitfield. I, I'm very grateful to the Minister to give way, and it is right that it sits within the remit of the committee. There's no question about that. But it's also not just the simple low-hanging fruit. This is a complex issue um, that the investigation, a proper investigation with a proper committee to do that, can add huge advantages going forward both to, to this Parliament but more importantly to Scotland. Minister. Yeah, absolutely. It's not for government to... Um, 
intervene in terms of how Parliament sets up and runs its committees, but I recognise the point that uh, uh, Martin Whitfield makes uh, and, uh, and also the, 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 uh, the fact uh, that the, the, what is in the FPAC report in that, uh, that regard as well. I thought it was very uh, uh, interesting and illuminating to, to listen to Maggie Chapman's um, remarks highlighting that work was done previously on this in 2009, I believe, um, uh, and that shows how it's important to seize the moment and address these issues when we have the opportunity. Otherwise, it can drift on for years, indeed decades. Um, and it's practical examples of how the merging of bodies, shared services, um, where, where, where sunset clauses have been mentioned by other members uh, and other models that uh, I believe that uh, the subcommittee have set up will, uh, will, uh, will uh, look into. So there's many options there to consider how this is taken forward. I thought Ross Greer's remarks, um, both his opening and closing, were, uh, were, were very helpful. Um, the importance or lack of institutional memory um, that he, he references uh, in that regard is, uh, is something we should all do well to reflect on. And having been here for um, almost uh, nine years now, um, it's remarkable how many things keep coming back I thought we'd addressed uh, and dealt with previously. Um, and his point on needing to do the political particularly difficult things is a measure of the effectiveness of, uh, of this place. He made the point very well that a simpler landscape um, is indeed perhaps more effective for those that we, uh, we seek to represent and the need for that, uh, that holistic approach. Um, Members also highlighted the need for government to address its own operations. Uh, Craig Hoy made this point, indeed Sarah Boyd and others, and I think members can rest assured that the government and myself are very focused on that, ensuring we get value for money from what uh, we deliver as a government within our own, uh, own uh, operations. Um, uh, recruitment controls are in place for that, uh, that very reason. Um, Recognise there has been some expansion in Scottish government um, uh, responsibilities over the years, but uh, the increase in the size of the operation has been uh, in excess of that, and that is something that needs to be and is indeed being addressed. So, in, in summary, government supports uh, the moratorium. That is clear. I, I came to the committee um, a, a number of weeks ago, and we, we, I was asked the question: Would uh, government support the, the moratorium? I made the comment at that point that I had to seek the agreement of colleagues uh, for that to be uh, the, the, the situation. So, I'm, I'm glad that uh, we have reached this place where government does indeed support the moratorium. But, of course, recognises the fact has been pointed out by members across the Chamber that proposals are already introduced are the responsibility of Parliament and its committees to, uh, to make uh, decisions on, and I have no doubt committees, uh, relevant committees, will take note of the debates today and its, uh, and its deliberation. So, in conclusion, Mr. Officer, I believe that Government has, uh, has set the tone on this. Uh, we recognise the importance of this agenda. We appreciate the work that FPAC has uh, done in this regard. We recognise that the Commissioner landscape uh, is in danger of um, becoming unwieldy with many, many proposals coming, coming forward. We recognise the need to address this in a holistic and structured way and understand the purpose of uh, commissioners. We uh, look forward to the work of uh, the committee that has been set up uh, to do that. Government commits to um, cooperate uh, fully with that committee and we look forward to its conclusions coming back to this place in due course. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you. And I now call on Liz Smith on behalf of the Finance and Public Administration Committee to wind up the debate. If you could take us to five o'clock, please. Uh, thank you. I have to say, uh, on a personal angle, before I sum up for the committee, I think it's one of the best debates that I've uh, participated in in this chamber because it is looking at the way that the Parliament works, and that should concern us all. And I want to start. Uh, on behalf of the committee by saying to Jeremy Balfour, to Colin Smith and to Sarah Boyack that we don't in any way underestimate the passion and the integrity and your commitment for the way in which you have represented the groups uh, that you have brought to the Parliament uh, with your own bills because I think it's very important to say that on behalf of the committee. This is not about the contributions of individual members or about some of the issues uh, that you have uh, brought to us. Um, because I think it's very important that uh, we understand this issue in the context of where we are actually starting from. And it's the case, as Michael Mara set out, that the evidence that was presented to us was pretty much unanimous. And I think that's uh, an important point because it recognised that the structure has evolved over time uh, on an ad hoc basis rather than on a coherent structure. That's been a problem. 
Uh, there has been obviously very significant financial pressures on the public finances, and I thought Ross Greer made uh, a really important point. Well, he made a very good speech, and I hope I don't trash my reputation for agreeing with him to, 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 ag ag again this week. But it was a very good uh, point he made about the fact that we started this week looking at fiscal sustainability, and actually this debate is also part of that uh, debate on fiscal sustainability. It's also about the concerns, I think, of the uh, delivery of some uh, public services that have been seen to be deficient. And I think uh, you could take from what Jeremy Balfour and Colin Smith and Sarah Boyett were saying is that they have naturally been very disappointed that the public services that should have been looking after the groups that they have chosen to represent have not been doing that. And I think there obviously has been from some of the witnesses uh, a concern that uh, when it comes to the Scottish Government's commitment to public sector reform, the Minister was very enthusiastic about the need to do that. There has been concern about the delay, the amount of time that that is uh, taking. And all of that context is very important to the committee to, to help us understand what it is that has been driving the very substantial increase in the number of proposals to create new SPC SPCB supported bodies following a period of relative stability in the Commissioner landscape before that. Because it is very clear from the evidence that the Finance Committee took that the current model is no longer fit for purpose since it lacks clarity, it lacks coherence, sufficient accountability and transparency over budget setting. And that combination potentially, I think, is something that could produce a very bad cocktail, bad for the stakeholders and potentially bad for the reputation of the Parliament. Now, the committee was very clear that we need to look at why it is that it, it is mainly the advocacy type of commissioner which uh, is seeing the bigger demand. And the Scottish Information Commissioner said to us, and I quote, a lot of the desire for the future commissioners is a bellwether to the lack of trust and confidence in a lot of public services. Well, my goodness, that's quite a strong comment, and I think that matters to all MSPs across the chamber. And Age Scotland commented that the SPCB supported model is, and I quote, an established way of getting more effective action on particular issues, especially as the model uh, provided for more independence, implying that the best route might not always be via ministers. But that said, other groups such as uh, Alliance took a very different uh, view, na namely that commissioners might act as a sticking plaster, as they called it, but not really solve the problem. And reflecting on these points, the committee was struck by the evidence that was presented to us by two former MSPs, Alex Neil and David Stewart, who had in the previous parliament been very enthusiastic about bringing members' bills forward to uh, have new advocacy commissioners, but they had completely changed their mind about the wisdom of doing so. And that was because they felt that it was a bit of buck passing when the uh, legislation should have been taken forward by ministers or by committees of the parliament. Now, others have said that the committee had some concerns that uh, the rise in the demand for advocacy commissioners was probably related uh, to the weak delivery of too many public services across Scotland. In other words, inherent failures within the existing system and the fact that the government finds it uh, too easy simply to say, well, the work can be done by a commissioner rather than by us. And I think that's something that we should all reflect upon, because um, I think several members actually uh, made the point to us that would it, would it not actually be better at targeting the money uh, into these public services to ensure that all the demands that we're asking for are actually uh, met through that public service? Likewise, as uh, Michael Mara rightly said, we found too much duplication within the system and too little awareness uh, amongst the public about the role being played by each commissioner. Plus, some commissioners, to our astonishment as a committee, told us that they didn't really feel that the accountability matter that they were being asked to uh, account for uh, had provided sufficient evidence to committees. In fact, one commissioner told us that despite writing seven different reports, uh, he had only been called before a committee once. Now, I think that tells us something about that. Can I raise uh, what I think is actually quite an important issue about the working of the Parliament uh, that has come from a lot of the debate around this? And it's about whether we have the appropriate structures in place in this Parliament um, with accountability to deal with the kind of decision-making 
that this debate has thrown up because this is about the working of Parliament. It is not party political. It's about the workings of Parliament and how effective we are in, in, in putting that uh, to the members of this Parliament and assuring that I, I think one of the great things about this debate is that there has been a very considerable consensus right around the political spectrum that the Parliament isn't working well enough when it comes to dealing with a lot of the advocacy issues. So I think that's important. And I, I say this with some experience myself, uh, having worked on the El Jamel case for 10 years. I understand why a patient safety commissioner uh, has been called for, because I don't feel that the existing system was dealing uh, with the concerns of the former patients of El Jamel. So I understand where all the people are coming from when they want individual uh, commissioners. But that said, I think there is a big issue about the lack of consistency, about the lack of coherence, and of course about public money. So, Presiding Officer, uh, can I just finish on behalf of the committee to say that we very much welcome uh, the debate. I think it's given the Parliament an awful lot of food for thought, including about uh, how we work and how we disburse public money. Um, and it's given us a lot to think about. And we have to take stock, think about what we're going to do for the future, which is why uh, the committee is calling for a moratorium so that in order to allow us to do that, I welcome uh, the Green Amendment that puts a timescale uh, on that. Um, so that's uh, very important. And can I finish by thanking all the witnesses from whom we took evidence, the SPCB for its very positive contributions, to members of the Parliament for their positive contributions, the Scottish Government for responding to our report, and all, as always our first class uh, team of clerks who are here up at the back of the Parliament. Uh, and I call on members to support the motion in the name of the committee. Thank you. That concludes the debate on Scotland's commissioner landscape. It's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of motion 15088 in the name of Fiona Hislop on legislative consent motion, passenger railway services, public ownership bill. And I call on the cabinet secretary to move the motion. Moved. Thank you. I now call on Sue Webber. Thank you, President Officer. The UK, this UK bill would remove the presumption in favour of franchised passenger railway services being provided by the private sector and instead allows train operations to be provided by a public sector company when existing franchise contracts end. Clause 1 would prohibit the Secretary of State or Scottish Ministers from extending existing rail franchises or entering into new franchise agreements apart from in specific limited circumstances. It would also remove the presumption in favour of franchise railway passenger services being provided by a private operator. Instead, these would be provided by a public sector company under a public sector contract. Clause 2 would place a duty on the relevant franchising authority to provide or secure passenger rail services by giving a direct award to a public sector company. The Secretary of State would also have the power to extend existing franchises or to agree new franchises with the same private sector operator as currently operates the service. Clause 3 would give the Secretary of State the regulation-making powers for consequential amendments, including for primary legislation. So ultimately, presiding officer, the aim of this bill is to bring all rail franchises into public hands, and this is something my party cannot support. On the 17th of July 2024, Shadow Transport Secretary Helen Waitley described nationalisation as a move that can only be based in ideology and said that nationalising well-run operators won't bring fares down Let's or make hear services Ms. Weber. more reliable. Furthermore, rail partners who represent the interests of private rate sector train and freight operators argued that full nationalisation is a political, not a practical solution which will increase costs over time. Yes, I will. Ross Greer. I am grateful to Ms Weber for taking the intervention. She seems to be arguing that nationalisation is ideological and therefore a bad thing. Surely privatisation was the ideological choice made in the first place? Sue Weber. My party believes that this would have a detrimental effect on Scottish travellers. Mr Greer, that rely on key cross-border services such as Avanti West Coast, but it would also limit competition. Cut-price rail providers such as Lumo, 
who have planned over the summer to provide an increased East Coast mainline service from Edinburgh Waverley to London King's Cross, and indeed hope to expand through to the West in Glasgow, could be prevented from providing such a service once the franchise ends. Finally, and more importantly, this legislation would tie the hands of Scottish ministers and compel them to keep ScotRail and the Caledonian Sleeper in public ownership. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, and I call on the Cabinet Secretary to respond. The Scottish Government's policy aims and objectives of a fully publicly owned railway is to deliver for the people of Scotland and to achieve our vision of a reliable, resilient, affordable and accessible railway. And the Railway Passenger Public Ownership Bill aligns with our policy aims, which is why we support this legislative consent motion and recommend that the Scottish Parliament supports it. Since ScotRail and Caledonian Sleeper moved into public sector control through operator of last resort arrangements, we have seen continued improvements as a result. ScotRail has added over 200 additional services each weekday, offering 7% more seats. Passenger numbers have increased by 75% from 46.7 million in 2021-22 to around 82 million in 2023-24. On average, ScotRail remains one of the highest scoring operators in terms of overall passenger satisfaction. It is fully appreciated that the last few months have seen a dip in comparison with the preceding period, and this coincides sided with the reduced service due to a temporary timetable. Now, the changes the Bill will make to the current railways legislation will allow rail passenger services to be delivered by a public sector company as the first choice option, rather than as a last resort under a franchising model the Scottish Government has regularly criticised. This will enable current public sector delivery arrangements to be made permanent, providing a stable framework from which we can continue to provide those services. We are not in favour of returning to the failed Tory franchise system. But any concern that the Bill removes the power of any future Scottish Government who may wish to reintroduce the franchise model, a failed model, is incorrect. The Scottish Parliament cannot currently make provision about the manner in which rail passenger services are provided. This is a reserve matter. Nothing in this UK Bill will change that. Therefore, only through full devolution of rail would any future Scottish Government truly be able to decide the preferred method of passenger rail service delivery, whether that be publicly or privately operated. This is one of the reasons full devolution of rail has been a long-standing objective of Scottish Ministers and a reason all members should support that position in consideration of the future UK GB Rail Bill. Any future changes to the railways legislation which impact on devolved powers would also be subject to the convention that the UK Government will not normally legislate with regard to devolved matters without the consent of the Scottish Parliament, which would be sought through a further legislative consent memorandum process as appropriate. Therefore, Presiding Officer, to ensure that we have a publicly owned, publicly run rail system in Scotland, I recommend that this Parliament votes to support the legislative consent motion for the UK Passenger Railway Services Public Ownership Bill. Thank you. And the question on this motion will be put at decision time. And there are five questions to be put as a result of today's business. Can I remind members that if the amendment in the name of Ivan McKee is agreed to, excuse me, the amendment in the name of Ross Greer will fall? And the first question is that amendment 15086.3 in the name of Ivan McKee, which seeks to amend motion 15086 in the name of Kenneth Gibson, on behalf of the Finance and Public Administration Committee on Scotland's Commissioner Landscape, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we'll move to a vote and there'll be a short suspension to allow members to access digital voting.